Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, earth. or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. You are? I am. Hey, Dan. What's up? I'm Lindsay. You're Lindsay. What's up, bro? <laughs> we have two fun announcements and then into today's stories. Uh, the first is in honor of Pride Month and also because of a concerning rising and to me, pretty surprising, uh, you know, tide of homophobia in 2023, we are introducing the new Bad Magic Pride Collection. So many cool items from swim trunks to water bottles to giant pride flags. Many of you have asked for a proper collection for quite a while, and we're happy to finally launch something for you. We celebrate the shared experience of horror for all walks of life, whether you are a creep or peeper, gay or straight, trans or non-binary, asexual and more. Whoever you are, ghosts and maybe even demons <laughs> are waiting to haunt the ever-loving shit out of you too and fill your head with nightmares. We, we believe in nightmares for everybody. That's nice. Mm -hmm. That's a really, really beautiful sentiment, Dan. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate our LGBTQIA plus friends and allies. Thank you for joining our world of horror and storytelling. Celebrate with us this month by checking out all the cool new products and designs at badmagicmerch.com. And if you want to share your picks on socials, once you get your merch, tag uh, hashtag badmagicpride so Logan can find you and we can check them out. Cool. Yeah, he was showing me the stuff. The Scared to Death merch hasn't come in yet. We get like samples of stuff, mm -hmm. but the water bottle, I was like, this is great. I mean, the yeah. design's cool, but it's like, it's a good water bottle. Yeah. You guys don't know this, but I have like a small. Um, there are a lot portable, of water bottles and coffee mugs and portable beverage containers yeah. are a thing I really enjoy. True, truly. Yeah, it is one of your quirks. Uh, and also, um, holy shit, we flew out to uh, Pennsylvania just this past oh weekend, uh, Tyler, Logan, Lindsay, and I, to check out the camp for the Wet Hot Bad Magic summer camp for, you know, September 21st to the 24th. Holy Oh crap. my God. It, holy it is, shit, holy balls, holy did, everything. Yep, we did the same shuttle transport that people will get when they go. For, we were in Newark is where we flew from. Mm -hmm. And it is such a cool drive to start with. Like, it's just such a pretty area. All these yeah. fun little towns. And then the camp is just like a world unto itself. Mm -hmm. They have people from over 30 countries working in this place. So it has like this really cool vibe. Um, a, yeah, Tyler was saying a, that last of night. Irish people. Yeah. yeah. I, Tyler was like, it's kind of like you felt like you were in another country because mm -hmm. there's so many accents flying around. Yeah. And because you're so, I don't want to say isolated, but kind of like you're just in the middle of yep. nowhere. Mm -hmm. In this like, and it's beautiful. God, it's crazy. Over 400 acres, this big private lake, like a natural spring-fed lake mm -hmm. that runs into this little like uh, stream, like as an outlet. You did catch two fish I because two you fish. are an I'm avid, avid fisherman. fisherman. I was, and I'm the only one who caught fish. I will, you know, just toot my own horn there. I mm -hmm. caught two smallmouth bass. Yeah, and that one smallmouth bass, he just swallowed the mm -hmm. rubber he, thing. He swallowed the the little jig. Not the hook, but the actual rubber part. So hopefully he coughed that out. Yeah. We, he seemed okay. We didn't see he him floating like, up he was, later. He was flipping around. But they, yeah, they fought good. But anyway, that was fun. And uh, and then there's like this giant water slide. We were oh we were brave enough this early to go down it, but we watched some little kids go down it. They, they, they were just like whipping down it time yep. after time. You know, kids, they don't feel temperature. We got to see, like we got to the night before, got to be part of an adult camp, just, you know, just a, you know, fly on the wall. Yeah. And watching the live music. Uh, a band that's going to be at our camp. Oh, they're so fun. They're like this great, uh, they do nothing but covers. Yeah. And they're just, it, that was a 90s themed yeah. part, party that night. Yeah. And it was so fun. And they just, it's just such a well-oiled machine. This huge lodge where everybody eats like for the main meals mm -hmm. and the way they lay it out, make it so easy. And, pe and they are on top of it. This yeah. place has over 400 staff members in total, over a, well over 100 dedicated to our event. Mm -hmm. And it is going to be, I mean, I'm so happy with year one. What we did was so fun and so special. Yeah. But this one is a massive upgrade as far as the, the background, mm -hmm. the they just specialize it and they are so passionate about it yeah. and so friendly. We met the owner and- oh, He was great. Him and his wife were awesome. Yeah, owners. Yeah, exactly. The, the two, yeah, two of the owners, uh, the husband and wife team. Mm -hmm. I guess there's like a group of four of them. Mm -hmm. And you can just tell, like if you've ever gone to a place where everybody is super like good customer service, like it comes from the top. Mm -hmm. Working in comedy clubs all these years, 
you would walk into a club sometimes and everybody's attitude would be shit. Yeah. And then you would meet the guy in charge. You're like, like, that's why. I understand. This place, exact opposite. Everybody's pumped. Yeah. Like they carefully select people. I'm just, we're so excited. And the amount of activities. Oh my God. Here and like outbuildings and like mm-hmm. indoor yeah. football fields and tennis courts. Crazy. It is, I can't explain how just in pictures, Massive. even going yeah. there. Yes. Ahead of time, I was like, oh, I'm excited to see all this. But once we actually took the tour, yeah. it sunk in like, there's so fucking much here. Crazy, yeah. like a skate park, 14 tennis courts. Sorry. Yeah. I just, yeah go ahead. <laughs> I'm like, can I say something about yeah. camp? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will say, like when we got there, I was crying as we pulled in because it's yeah. just, first of all, it's majestic. It's beautiful. Pristine, clean, well-maintained mm-hmm. grounds. And I just like, I wanted to be at this camp previously. I thought that it was the right fit. And right. our previous partner in this was yeah. was uninterested in having anyone else weigh in on something like this. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. so I was, there was a part of me that was like kind of sad when we pulled in. I'm like, it could have been this grandiose from the beginning. Right. But then I was thinking about year one and how intimate it was. And then I got a little worried thinking, I was like, God, is it still going to feel cozy and connected? And you better believe yeah. it because listening, there was only 180 campers at this private event this past mm-hmm, weekend. Mm-hmm. And they gathered around on the last night to do like, you know, uh, cutest couple and uh, best dress or I don't know, like whatever, silly yeah. little awards. And people were getting choked up. They were talking about yeah. like, uh, this has been a bucket list item of mine. I came by myself. Mm-hmm. I felt like we were with bad magic people, yeah. even though they weren't. That's was, what I was saying. There are so many space lizards here who don't ah, even know they are yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. And it just was so beautiful to watch this community of people come together. So it was kind of like watching our own event from the outside. Yep. And uh, like this giant pavilion with this huge like couch swing around a fireplace. And and it still has this intimacy, even though there's over 400 acres of activities and things to do and lodging, yeah. you still feel so close together. It's, it's awesome. Oh, you guys are going to love it. And you don't have to carry your bags. They'll, right. they'll use a little gator truck to get things to your cabin, electricity, proper showers, mm. proper bathrooms, bring your poopery. <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah, just everything about it was, mm-hmm. I don't know, painting and Prosecco. And like, they have a backup plan if it rains and mi- midnight pizza. And mm-hmm. I don't know. I never went hungry. There was accommodations for vegetarians, gluten-free, dairy-free, like, and they're, just- They're on it. And everybody's welcome. Yep. Like their yep. staff is all inclusive and they they vet who they allow to use this camp. They don't just let anybody come there yep. and host an event. They're not up for a money grab. I mean, they have their costs and they are what mm-hmm. they are, but they're careful about who gets to come in there. Yeah. So tickets available at badmagicmerch.com, September 21st to 24th. It is going to be fucking epic. Epic. <laughs> <laughs> and if you come, you'll get first dibs on next year's tickets too. Oh yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. that's the whole thing. We have some, we have some fun stuff planned for you guys. Some good surprises. Um, okay, so now that we've said that, sorry, we were just so sorry. pumped. Oh, I know. I'm like on a high from it. It was just yeah, so great. We just got back. Uh, what fan horror do you have today? Oh yeah, that's a great question. What do I have? I'm just so excited about camp. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care about horror. Yes, uh, you do. I mean, I do. I do. I do. I care mostly about great horror stories for camp, which, by the way, is haunted. Oh, yeah. We found out this weekend, too. So we're trying to find somebody who can tell us that story. Uh, Okay. I have three stories this week for you, Dan. Okay. And for our friends, our Roberts and Annabelles, Creeps and Peepers. Um, My three stories are an imaginary friend, question mark. Okay. Maybe. Story two, she called for me. Mm. Bizarre little story. And number three, a little friend in a little funeral home. Oh, interesting. All right. Um, I have uh, one from two stories. My first is from your least favorite category. UFOs. Yep. A claim of UFO sightings and alien abduction. Pretty intense. Um, So I'll share the claims of a young family from the 90s coming in from, you know, the set in the 90s. Uh, It comes in from a small city in Eastern Australia. And then we'll go cryptid and examine the uh, story of the Black Flash from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, that a shadowy but seemingly, you know, physically very real creature terrorize the residents of a little town on Cape Cod. Okay. Um, the sightings began in the fall of 1939, and that's where I'll start my story. Do you think for that UFO story, I can just claim that it couldn't possibly be real since Australia is not real? Oh, yeah, you could go down that conspiracy road. Cool, yeah, great, road, great. Sure. Uh, better make sure you're extra cozy before we begin. Let me know when your socks are loaded up and you're ready to get extraterrestrial. Look at these great Montana socks. How cute are those guys? And they're almost, I chose them because they're almost rainbows. So they're like almost pride. I somehow don't have any pride socks, which seems not okay. <laughs> but Target sold out before I could get any. All right. Okay, let's do it. Take uh, me to that place that doesn't I will, exist. I will take you. Uh, in the mid-90s, Scott and Wendy Longley 
appeared to be a perfectly normal married couple living in Grafton, New South Wales, Australia, small city of around 20,000 people and a three and a half hour drive south of Brisbane. Scott and Wendy were university-educated professionals running a successful business, according to a talk show host who interviewed the couple. They had a son and a daughter, two-and-a-half-year-old Scott Jr. and -and one-and-a-half-year-old Bronwyn when the events of the story took place. Scott and Wendy had no history of mental illness, either personally or in their families. And according to the couple, before their alleged extraterrestrial encounter, they held the same view as billions of other people when it comes to intelligent beings from other planets visiting ours. They thought that, sure, aliens maybe could be real, but they certainly weren't firm believers. And then one random evening, that belief was changed dramatically. Time now for the tale of the Longley abduction. On March 16th, 1996, Scott, Wendy, and their kids were heading home from visiting some friends in Lismore, another small city of about 40,000. They left their friend's house around 7 p.m. to start when, uh, to start what they initially expected to be a quiet, uneventful two-hour drive home. Along the way, they stopped to get something to eat, then hit the road again, with Scott driving along Bruxner Highway. They were traveling along a dark section of the road about five miles north of the little 10,000-person-ish town of Casino when Scott noticed two strange lights in the vehicle's rearview mirror. Scott only noticed them because for miles, his car was the only one on the road. He wasn't initially spooked by them whatsoever, assuming they came from an approaching vehicle catching up to him. But then soon the lights changed. They no longer looked like headlights. They were now a different hue of yellow, and they were surrounded by a halo of white light. Scott t- tried to remain focused on the road in front of him, but he couldn't stop looking in his rearview mirror, watching the strange lights behind him continue to change. Moments after changing color and emitting that halo of white light, they began to move inward towards one another, and they gradually merged into one single bright light. Scott was mesmerized. He decided not to say anything to Wendy to avoid scaring her. Unbeknownst to him, Wendy was also captivated by strange lights. While Scott was focused on what was behind them, Wendy was noticing more lights up in front of them and out to her left. She claimed to witness, as she described them, 200 or so fairy lights, and they were white and a bright green in color. Wendy only saw these lights for a few seconds before they vanished. She asked Scott if he saw them as well, but he hadn't. He'd been keeping his eye on the strange lights in the rearview mirror. Neither of them were frightened, not yet. At this point in their evening, the lights just provided something interesting to talk about on the remainder of their drive home. They hadn't noticed, distracted by their conversation, that they had just completely lost 45 minutes of their day. When they got home, they found it strange that they arrived 45 minutes later than expected, but for whatever reason, they didn't connect that to the lights at that time. The family got home around 9.30 p.m. Scott and Wendy normally went to bed around 10.30, but this night they both had trouble falling asleep. Wendy went to bed around midnight, where it took her quite some time to actually fall asleep. Scott watched TV until 2.30 in the morning, They both felt, according to an interview later, unusually active and energetic. Scott woke up just two and a half hours later at 5 a.m. to go for a run with a friend, and he would say he didn't feel the least bit tired. He did feel an unusual pricking sensation in his nose when he first got up, but it quickly went away. During his run, he felt a painful blister on his right big toe. It hurt bad enough he had to stop running and return home. He was surprised as he wasn't jogging in any new shoes or anything. And then as he walked home, he started to feel like he was coming down with a cold. When he walked into his house, he learned that his whole family was feeling off. Scott had a runny nose and other mild symptoms. Wendy had a sore throat and randomly pain in her left ovary. Scott Jr. had a runny nose and some blood in his mucus and little Bronwyn, or Bronwyn, far too young to explain how she was feeling, was clearly not doing great either. Scott and Wendy now got a bit worried. Scott Jr. had only had one cold before that 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 they could remember, and he'd never had a nosebleed. Had they caught something serious? The family would continue to feel off, experience restlessness, and not be able to sleep well. But still, they didn't connect all of this to the lights, not on the first day following that experience. But then the next day, on March 18th, both Scott and Wendy found odd marks on the backs of their necks. Little wounds of some kind. They had no idea how they'd got there. Now Scott started to wonder if something really strange had happened on the family's drive home on March 16th. Later that day, Scott and Wendy contacted a Sydney-based UFO research group. Wendy would soon talk to UFO researcher uh, Moira McGee, who suggested that hypnotherapy could I know that really is her name <laughs> could help them recover their memories of the missing time they experienced. We just have a little McGee joke in the family. Scott and Wendy hesitated. Were they really going to pursue the possibility that they had been abducted by aliens? 
They might never have done so, not really, had something else not happened another two days later. On Wednesday, March 20th, a local paper featured a story about UFO sightings over Grafton on the night of March 16th, spotted at almost the exact same time Scott and Wendy saw those lights on the road. The article listed the name and phone number of Gary White, who was trying to get in touch with witnesses. Wendy contacted White and set up a meeting. Both she and Scott met with him, and they told him what they saw, talked about the lost time, and described the symptoms of the sudden onset of illness in their family. White photographed the blister that hadn't healed yet on Scott's foot and the red marks on the back of Scott and Wendy's necks. He agreed with Moira that hypnotherapy could help them recall what happened during those forgotten 45 minutes. Scott and Wendy both agreed to be hypnotized. They talked to a hypnotherapist only listed as Sue in sources, and their first session took place two weeks later. Scott took the initial appointment, his first of three hypnotic regression sessions. Scott described his memories from a bird's eye view as if he were looking down on both himself and Wendy and watching what happened to two strangers rather than experiencing it himself. He saw their car completely stopped on the road. He was sitting in the driver's seat with Wendy in the passenger seat. Bronwyn was asleep and Scott Jr. was awake in the back. Two alien-like beings approached their vehicle. They were tall, around seven feet in height. They had gray skin, small ears, large black eyes, small mouths with two dots instead of a protruding nose. While they certainly didn't look human, they also didn't instill fear in Scott. He later told a journalist for the Daily Telegraph, I can recall thinking of the aliens, what beautiful people. Once they made it to the car, the aliens opened the driver's side door, removed Scott from the vehicle. Two more aliens then removed Wendy, followed by a smaller alien who tried to take Bronwyn out of her car seat. When it was unsuccessful, another alien joined in and took her out. Scott Jr. was left inside the car. Wendy and Bronwyn were now taken to a nearby field, Scott was carried to the back of the car and laid on the ground face down. He watched as one of the creatures took what looked like a silver staple gun and push it against the back of his neck and insert something into him. They also inserted something into his right foot, the foot with the blister. Next, the beans turned him over, lifted up his shirt, and started examining his abdomen. Scott had a scar on his stomach from a car accident in 1995, and the aliens seemed especially interested in it. Still under hypnosis, he watched himself stand up with the help of the aliens, and then in the next moment... He was back in his body, now seeing things through his own eyes. And to his amazement, he realized he could speak telepathically with the aliens around him. Scott asked them what they wanted. They told him they were a lost family and they needed a sample from him for reasons he didn't quite understand. Scott next recalled seeing his son happily running around the field, playing and laughing with a group of smaller aliens he assumed to also be children. Throughout all of this, Scott said he never felt afraid. In fact, he felt entirely comfortable with the aliens. He next watched some of the aliens take Wendy and Bronwyn back to the car and even put their seatbelts back on. Strangely, he said that one of them may have kissed Wendy on the cheek as they buckled her in. Before returning to his car, he also saw a crowd of at least 20 beans in the field where Scott Jr. was playing with the smaller childlike aliens. And then he watched an alien spacecraft drop down above them all, hovering over the air. Wendy, who would also see the ship in her own hypnotic session, described it in a 19, uh, 1966, oh my gosh, 1996 interview as like a cliched saucer, circular and very large. Before vanishing, the aliens communicated to Scott that they wanted him. He took this to mean that they wanted him to enter their ship and travel with them to wherever they were going. He telepathically communicated that he needed to stay with Wendy and the children. They didn't push back against his wishes, but before vanishing, they did further examine him. The next memory he recovered was of him being strapped to a table inside what he assumed was their ship and a different looking group of aliens examined him. As reported by the Daily Telegraph, Scott said, there was a strong set of lights to my left and above me there were three round lights. I also noticed a mechanical arm at one end of the table which had four claws to it. A moment later, he was back in the chair. He touched Wendy's knee and she and Bronwyn woke up. The aliens had vanished. It seemed like Scott Jr. had been awake the entire time but because he was so young, he wasn't able to talk about what if anything he might have witnessed. Finally, Scott now recalled that right after they arrived home, he looked out the window and saw a spacecraft in their backyard. He asked what the aliens were doing, and they told him they were checking to make sure they had arrived home safely. Wendy's memories were more vague than Scott's. More or less, they shared the same story. During his next session, Scott again remembered the aliens being kind to him, but then during his third session, he recalled the aliens being much more aggressive. He additionally recalled a history of being abducted and undergoing previous alien examinations at the ages of 4, 8, and 14. A few months after the incident, Scott and Wendy shared additional details when they were interviewed about their alleged experience with uh, the extraterrestrials. 
by Carrie Ann Kennerly, who hosted the Australian daytime variety TV show Midday from 1996 to 1998. Wendy shared some of her memories of the night of the abduction. She said she recalled just lying on a table with faces looking over me. Scott saw the same figures, like hockey mask figures, if you can imagine the hockey mask, and nasty looking equipment. Wendy could not recall experiencing any type of actual communication with the aliens. Scott shared most of his supposed telepathic conversations. He said the first time they spoke to me was outside the vehicle, and they said to me that we're very lucky people, very nice people. Then later in the spacecraft, they inserted this long rod through my right eye, and they said, you will feel some pain. And I said, no, I'm not. There was no discomfort. Scott and Wendy asserted to Carrie Ann that they had not gained financially from their story and didn't plan to in the future. Scott said, we're not here to gain anything at all. We're only here to tell people what we saw, what we went through as a family, and some will believe, some won't. It doesn't really matter. We just want to tell you, hey, they are out there, and this is what happened to us. Wendy said that she thinks the aliens were protecting and checking on them, similar to the way wildlife officials protect animals. Scott also revealed in the interview that the aliens told him they would come back for him. And perhaps they already have. The Longley family continued to claim to experience strange phenomena for years after their abduction, such as seeing lights, having odd dreams, and knowing things they shouldn't be able to know, like who was calling them before answering the phone. The YouTube channel Eyes on Cinema uploaded their 1996 interview with Carrie Ann Kennerly on September 17th, 2022, if you want to watch it. Approximately three months ago, a user named Scott Rossetti, with a profile picture of a man who sure looks a lot like Scott Longley, commented, Wow, I didn't know our interview was on YouTube. I will enjoy reading the comments. I still remember it like yesterday. It took my life on a completely different journey than planned. Thank you. Beyond this, it is difficult to find updates on what the Longley family has been up to and whether or not they continue to experience further alien encounters to this day. I don't know. I don't know if you buy it? I don't know. They didn't gain anything other than some exposure. You know, maybe like a 50 minutes fame kind of thing. These aliens just seem too nice. Yeah? You're, you're opposed to nice aliens? <laughs> I, I, I don't know that I can really like recall another story where someone was like, yeah, no, it was good. It mm -hmm. was good. They were nice. They were kind. Yeah, they were, I wasn't afraid. Were... Well, I guess there was that one guy, man, this is forever ago, like he set out to like leave with the aliens. He like disappeared and was yeah, never to be Canada. seen again. Yeah. yeah I think so I guess he too. wasn't afraid. Mm -hmm. True. Okay. I mean, in a way, you would think I'd be happy because, you know. Maybe I don't have to be afraid of aliens. I just, I just think like, uh, like we talk about with ghosts all the time. With you know, if, if we're really going to go down the road of like, you know, there's other life in the universe. Yeah. How much other life is in the universe, and you know, like how many different types of aliens you know are visiting Earth. Yeah. And it could be dozens. Could be who knows. So some could be nice. Some could be good. Yeah. Some could be in between. I do think those little like marks on the back of their neck, I had made a note about that. I was like, of course. I feel like they probably like plugged them into something. Mm, That's yeah. what it felt like. You said stable gun. I was like, oh yeah, it's exactly what I was thinking. Like at the base of your neck, just kind of like. Some kind and, of matrix plug in. Yeah. I, I recently uh, heard a theory that the reason the shapes are always different, like the, um, you know, some are saucer-like, some are pill-like. Oh yeah. Some uh -huh. are cigar-like, whatever. Uh -huh. is, the, is that uh, basically the craft is biologically engineered to fit the entity that is coming here specifically. So the craft is a custom build to like morph into the, so the entity is the craft. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like, uh, yeah, that's a uh, interesting theory. Yeah. That the spaceship, it, uh, spaceship itself is a creature of sorts. Could be. Or some, or some kind of bionic, like, you know, like a cyborg type creature perhaps. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have some pictures. Here's a screenshot I took from the YouTube video of Scott and Wendy uh, speaking with Carrie Ann Kennerly in 1996. Okay. Everybody looks normal. Everybody looks pretty normal. It looks uh, like they're wearing some sweet 90s clothes. So I like the like colors. It looks like the 90s. Yep. It's very, uh, well, he primary look, colors. He kind of looks like Randy Johnson. <laughs> yeah, he does. He looks, he looks like, yeah, a little bit like a shorter Randy Johnson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Randy Johnson getting cleaned up, cut, cut the mullet. Uh, here's this next picture of the family from 1996. Uh, Scott, Wendy, Scott Jr., and Bronwyn. Yeah, I mean... Okay. I mean, I don't know what, you know, like. It's like a normal family. Yeah. Uh-huh. Did like, you say that was a magazine cover? Uh, this this one is from a magazine, yeah. Yeah, okay, because I was trying to figure out the background. And then uh, this next one, an illustration of the type of alien Scott claimed to speak with and witness. But that one looks so scary. I know, but he didn't think it was scary. I don't know. I don't think I care for that. And then here's another illustration of what these things may have looked like. So you don't want to have one of those things stick some stuff oh, in your neck? God. 
that one just feels almost like too lifelike. I don't know. Like I know. The, I think the that's muscles, like muscles. It's mm-hmm. like a weird, uncanny valley. It's a cool like rendering that some. Yeah, I just couldn't find the the artist credit, but a really cool like rendering of what this thing might look like. Yeah, its eyes feel intelligent. Yeah. Ah. I don't know, man. I don't know. Man, that would be fucking wild to see one of those things. Well, and like a whole family. Mm-hmm. I wonder what Bronwyn and Little Scott would say now, now that they can speak. Yeah, what, I wonder, do, do they even remember? I mean, probably, because if their parents are still, if it's a like a family story that they're, mm-hmm. excuse me, still talking about. I don't know. They were so little, like what, one and a half and two and a half, I believe. Yeah. But still. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I'm, I'm just trying to like put my uh, head in the space of like, you know, you're out somewhere. I mean, yes, they, they don't they don't have an actual memory and there are problems as I've talked about many times on here and time suck and stuff about, you know, false memory syndrome and hypnotic regression. You know, there's, uh, yeah, you can think that you remember something and it can be completely untrue. That's definitely a possibility. Uh, I just think about how intense it would be to not under hypnosis, see the creatures that we just showed picture of, like actually see that shit. I mean, I wouldn't think they were friendly. I'd be freaked out. I, yeah. I'd be screaming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But Ooh. also, um, in the beginning, they didn't take little Scott out of the car. They just took out Bronwyn, which I thought was weird. Mm-hmm. It's they like, must've took him out later. Well, according to his, you know, memories later, then he sees him playing with some other kids. Yeah. But that's just a memory. Like you don't necessarily know that that happened. All of it though, true. All of it came from hypnosis. Right, right. All the details of the actual abduction, not, he didn't remember any of that on his own. Well, and then Scott says that he had multiple abductions, like two, four, and 14 or something. And that came through hypnosis later. Like he had no memory mm. of ever being abducted prior to hypnosis. And now, and then also like he's kind of been marked. They say like they mm-hmm. want to come back for him. So what makes this one I- seem like, oh, so go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, maybe more real. I mean, I do have a lot of, you know, skepticism. Like, like when things only come from hypnotic sessions, mm-hmm. I am you know, uh, I tend to not believe them. Sure. But this one, I, I found it interesting that there was a sighting of other lights, like like it was reported in the paper a couple of days later. If we trust their timeline of events, if we, right. tr- if we trust their story, that they saw something a couple of days later, they reach out to some ufo- ufologists to talk about like, you know, uh, do you think that I was abducted perhaps? They're mm-hmm, considering mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. And then a couple of days after that, there's an actual newspaper article that said a bunch of UFOs were spotted exactly in that same area. Around they, the same time. Mm-hmm, when they had missing time. Missing time is an indicator of a lot of abductions. I know that that somehow seems worse to me because it's like, okay, if you are abducted by aliens, but you're not really sure. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you have it already in your brain that they look like what we just, yeah, like that's what we've been fed, that that's what aliens look like. Yeah. Okay, you could be scared, but you could also just be like, well, you know, I picked that up in a book I read, an article I read, a movie I saw. Mm -hmm. But losing time is so freaky to me. Yeah. To just like 45 minutes? Yeah. That's not five minutes. That's not like, oh, I lost five minutes of my life scrolling on Instagram. Right. Just completely unaccounted for? Yeah, if you're on a drive that you've done, you know, a bunch of times before and you've taken into account how long you stopped and everything— you know, because there's that thing that some people aren't always looking at their, you know, uh, sure. watch. And this is the 90s, so you're not like as as aware of time because of uh, cell phones. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but you would know, like, yeah, that would just be a strange thing to get home and be like, wait a minute, how, where did that time go? Like, where right. did the extra five, 45 minutes come from? Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. And uh, oh, there was one other thing. Now I can't remember what I was going to say. Oh, well. Too bad, so sad. Okay, well, if it pops up later. Yeah, I'll let you know. Uh, so, um, any more questions about this abduction? If not, we can head to Cape Cod. I know you're a big fan of that place. I do love Massachusetts. And then not much setup before we dive into this one. Uh, you may have been here, Provincetown. Um, sorry, I'm just putting my watch on Do Not Disturb. Hmm. It keeps vibrating. Ah, it's, I know, it's distracting. distracting. Okay. Uh, Provincetown. Well, where it's is it? It's at the tip. Very tippy top. Very, Cape Cod. Well, I've been to Nantucket. Mm, okay. Not Cape Cod, so. Oh, okay. I get those yeah. two flipped around in my brain. How dare you? Yeah. In October of 1939, many of the residents of the summer resort of Provincetown, uh, Massachusetts, often called P-Town, uh, out on the very tip of Cape Cod, claimed that they were terrorized by a tall, shadowy figure they called the Black Flash. Most of those who didn't claim to encounter the creature directly uh, initially thought these stories were nothing more than a teenage Halloween hoax, but over time... More and more residents believed it was actually some kind of supernatural being. Some believed that the devil himself had take up, taken up residence in their town. To this day, no one knows for sure who or what this phantom figure really was. Time now for the tale of the Black Flash. 
In the fall of 1939, after the last of the summer tourists had left, many of the local children in Provincetown started scurrying home, completely terrified by some monster many of them claimed to have witnessed with their own eyes. A tall, dark beast made up mostly of shadows. Children claimed that this thing stared at them with silvery blue eyes and growled before running away at seemingly impossible speeds, laughing maniacally as it fled. On October 23, 1939, the Boston Globe published a story from Provincetown about the monster. This resort town, which manages to keep in the public eye even after the artists leave for a warmer climate in the fall, has a new what is it in the form of a hooded figure which prowls the streets at night. Nobody has seen the thing's face, but a couple of boys who claim they met the apparition head-on say it has a mouth and speaks in a guttural tongue. Two terrified youths raced 15 blocks into the lighted center of the town in the small hours of this morning after they claimed the flash rushed out of an alley at them yelling. The boys described the figure as being roughly seven feet tall and made up of a shadowy, billowing body. An elderly woman also reported encountering the black flash on her windowsill, saying it stared at her for just a few moments before screaming, or her screaming seemed to drive it away. After this incident, approximately 40 boys in town went out looking for the black flash. The Boston Globe reported, hidden behind trees and camped in doorways, the youthful vigilantes watched through the night for the appearance of the man who has been frightening women with his ghostly appearance at windows and, worse, has been setting fires in homes. The boys said they planned to keep watch until Police Chief Anthony Travers and Fire Chief T. Julian Lewis were certain that the threat to their town was over. Still, at this point, few believe the children's tales of the Black Flash. But then another woman, Maria Costa, claimed to see the creature herself. Her account was published three days after the Globe's article in the Provincetown Advocate on October 26, 1939, in an article titled, Fall Brings Out the Black Flash, Hard Winter Certain as Cabin Fever Stories Start. The paper reported that Maria was walking alone one chilly night earlier that month when she spotted a shadow moving around outside a closed door. She looked more closely at it, expecting it to just be a figment of her imagination, but it didn't go away. She soon lost track of the entity as it disappeared behind the store. On edge now, she continued with her walk and she was passing by the town hall when she said she saw it again. She claimed that the tall, dark figure jumped out from the bushes and just for a moment stood close enough to touch. She reported that it had piercing, fiery eyes and large silver ears, and that it simply stared at Maria for a few moments. She was too shocked to do anything but stare back. Then suddenly the creature leapt straight up into the air and quickly bounded away, mimicking the movement of a gazelle until she couldn't see it any longer. Maria, finally able to move again, ran into a nearby coffee shop, screaming for help. A group of men ran outside ready to chase down the figure, but found nothing. Maria described what she saw to the police saying, he was black, all black, with eyes like balls of flame, and he was big, maybe eight feet tall. Oddly, she also reported that the black figure made a buzzing sound, like a bee or some other insect. Over the next week, more and more Provincetown residents reported seeing this tall, black, shadowy thing moving throughout town after dark. It was given several names. The Provincetown Phantom, the Phantom Fiend, the Devil of the Dunes, and the one that over time has become most associated with this entity, the Black Flash. Despite numerous supposed sightings, no one was able to provide a real detailed description. Some described a tall black figure in a long cape. Others saw a being seemingly constructed mostly of shadows, gifted with superhuman speed, that allowed it to escape just as quickly as it arrived. According to some witnesses, the Black Flash could leap over 8 to 10 foot barriers without any issue. Most people put the Black Flash somewhere around 8 to 10 feet tall, with glowing eyes that differed a bit from person to person. Some saw blue or silver, others saw the color of fire. A few noticed pointed silver ears, and as Maria Costa described, at least one witness heard that the thing emitted an odd insect-like buzzing sound. Several others heard the black flash uttering throaty groans. In seemingly all of the encounters, the black flash appeared out of nowhere, often leaping out from trees. In some cases, it dropped down in front of people from a rooftop. And then it always seemed to run off like a gazelle or some other type of creature known for bounding speed. There were so many reports that the local police got involved, opening an, inv an investigation. Uh, the police and many of the people in town thought at first that the menacing figure was nothing more than some teen troublemaker. But then as more and more descriptions of sightings poured in, more people started to fear that the Black Flash was actually something supernatural. Even some local law enforcement started to wonder if the thing was of this world or not. According to police tips, it did things no human could do. 
For example, someone would call the police from the west end of the city to report that the black flash just ran through someone's yard on Tremont Street. A minute later, another call would come in from Howland Street on the east end of town. It would be physically impossible for any human to run or even drive across town that fast. One man claimed he chased the black flash, but said he very quickly lost pace with the creature. A teen boy ran into the police station crying one night, claiming that the black flash jumped at him and spit blue flames into his face. In another encounter, a dog cornered the black flash in the yard of a local man named Charles Farley. Farley came from outside or came outside with a shotgun, but froze when he saw the black flash, the monstrous figure with silver ears. When he regained his senses, he said he fired his weapon at the creature and was sure he hit it. But the beast didn't react as if it had been wounded. He said the shadowy figure literally laughed at him, then leapt over his eight foot tall fence and escaped. After a little over a week or so, so many sightings, or after a little, a little over a week of so many sightings, the creature seemed to disappear. Some thought that local authorities had captured it or maybe even killed it. But then on November 9th, the advocate ran a story titled, Chief Denies Current Rumors. The article stated, Chief of Police Anthony P. Tarvers this morning absolutely denied the rumors uh, current that the so-called Black Flash had been captured. As far as I'm concerned, the Black Flash is dead and gone, said the chief. Several future witnesses will disagree with this assessment. According to author Robert Ellis Cahill, who interviewed Cape Cod locals for his 1984 book, New England's Mad and Mysterious Men, sightings while infrequent continued after 1939. Sometime in the early 40s, a local fisherman named George Leboas said he saw the Black Flash in the town common. When the figure leapt out at him, George claimed that he managed to get a punch in, but he didn't seem to harm the entity whatsoever. George said the Black Flash grabbed his fist, squeezed it so hard he dropped to his knees, and the creature laughed maniacally at his torment. Also in the 40s, a local pool hustler, nicknamed Eight Ball Charlie, <laughs> boasted that he'd like to meet the phantom face to face, and then one evening seemingly got his wish. He claimed that as he was walking home one cold fall night, he saw a shadow moving on the road ahead. And right away, he knew what it was. He was shocked by the black flash's size. He watched it spread what he first thought was a cape like wings, and he saw intense silver eyes staring back at him. Fearful, but trying his best not to show it, Charlie claimed he said, you better get out of my way or I'll smack you one. Less than a second later, Charlie claimed that he was slapped in the face so hard he fell to the ground, and when he managed to get up, he ran home as fast as he could with the black flash on his heels, taunting him with menacing laughter. In November of 1945, the phone rang at the local Provincetown police station with more claims of sightings. The police were receiving reports that the black flash was in the schoolyard. Sergeant Francis Marshall was dispatched to the scene. He hoped that the school's 10-foot-high fence and single exit could keep the phantom in. The officers quietly pulled up with no headlights or sirens, hoping to finally solve their community's enduring mystery. One officer stayed outside, three officers entered the fenced in area, and they claimed to find the black flash standing in the corner of the schoolyard. Author Joseph Citro later wrote in his book, Passing Strange, True Tales of New England Hauntings and Horrors. At this point, Sergeant Marshall got his first and only good look at the phantom. Later, he would say that he was sure the terrifying face was some kind of silver-painted mask, and the creature was big, though perhaps not as big as dozens of terrified witnesses had reported. According to the report, the Flash glared at the officers, laughed when it was ordered not to move. Citro wrote in his book, in a final demonstration of superhuman bravery and skill, the black-clad figure turned and with one mighty leap, soared over the 10-foot fence and vanished. Nothing remained but the echo of a scornful laugh fading into the Provincetown night. The final known sighting occurred in December of 1945. Local children, Al, Joey, Eleanor, and Louis Jannard, were all playing in their yard at their house on Standish Street when Eleanor thought she saw a bear on a nearby hill. Al, who had already supposedly seen the phantom previously, would say when he looked at the creature his sister spotted, he knew what it was right away. The children now watched as the figure started crawling down the hill towards them, their parents were gone, so the Jannard kids had no one to defend them but themselves. They ran inside and grabbed knives, rolling pins, anything that could pass as a weapon. Staring at the front door, they all watched in horror as the doorknob started to turn. In their panic, they had not locked it. The children now fled, tried to hide themselves as best they could around the house, but then the creature never came in. And that was the last time the Black Flash was ever seen in Provincetown. People have been speculating as to the true identity of the Black Flash going on more than 80 years now. What the hell was that thing? Was the Black Flash a series of people playing pranks or something truly paranormal? The mystery remains unsolved. 
While, of course, at least some of the encounters could be hoaxes, some seem extremely difficult to file away as some sort of joke. What kind of prankster laughs off a shotgun blast? Or an encounter with several armed officers? Because of some of these reported sightings, the legend of the Black Flash possibly truly being a paranormal entity will likely continue to endure for many, many years to come. Okay. I think it was a person. Yeah? Because... How do they jump 10 feet over a 10 feet fence? Okay, I'm not entirely sure about like some of the details, right. but the entity, human or otherwise, mm-hmm. never really harms anybody. True. And never really touches anyone. Scares people, but doesn't touch them. So, yes. Yeah, so I'm like, okay. I mean, okay, there was that one person that says they, well, I punched I punched it. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was his name? Charles or something. Right. And, and then the thing supposedly like like, like a superhero grabbed its, his fist uh-huh. and squeezed it hard enough to drop into his knees. I know, but some people don't have like the same kind of pain receptors. Mm-hmm. And so I, I don't know. I was like, like a trying- very strong athletic person. Yeah. I mean, it just, because it feels like, well, I guess an entity could just be enjoying the, the fear it's causing. Yeah. And it could be tall tales. I will say uh, the era that this uh, story is set in. Yeah. Comic books were huge and, and it reads very much like a like a super villain. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It mm-hmm. does. Because even, even down to the name it was given. Yeah. The Black Flash. Mm-hmm. I, I like it though. I think it's a fun story. I actually thought it would make like a great uh, horror movie, but like more like age appropriate for younger children. Oh, yeah. Where it'd be scary and spooky, mm-hmm. but, but you probably wouldn't have nightmares. Right. Uh, it almost feels like <laughs> it's so random, like a Scooby-Doo mystery. Yeah, exactly. And at the well, end, they tear the mask off, the Black Flash. Well, because I was trying to pull all the elements together. Principal Wembley, or, you know, who, yeah, who yeah. whatever. Yeah. Principal Wembley. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> kind of loves Scooby-Doo. <laughs> yeah. um, but, like, all the details of, like, the silver ears, the, like, there was, like, not fire breathing, but there was something with, like. Blue flame. One kid reported getting, like, blue flame in his face. Another uh, witness reported seeing, like, fiery eyes. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, well, I mean, these details could be faked. The only thing yeah. that led me more into paranormal was, I forgot the year. So, I was, like, writing, like, when was this? Because I was thinking about if it was more modern. Yeah. Because this was, like, the 30s and 40s. Me. Yeah. I was thinking it was more, like, 70s, 80s. I don't know why. I just, like, got lost in the story. Yeah. But it would have been easy to do some of these things with, you know, yeah. prosthetic, like the, the silver ears and contacts and, and, you know, different elements that you could add to yourself. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. Maybe not. I don't know. You could be on stilts. That was the one thing I was thinking about because they said it was so tall. True. I, yeah, the, but, I mean, but it was also very agile. Right. That, that's where I keep going to like different places in my head. I'm like, okay, let's say it was on stilts. But if it was on stilts, nobody runs fast in stilts. I don't know that that's true. I think people do. Not real fast. I don't I think, think. I no, think they I run pretty fast. Nope, they don't. I think they can run like I don't know, maybe like a five or six minute mile on stilts. <laughs> uh, and then um, other like there was other you know claims of this bounding, a lot of bounding stuff. Yeah. And then that made me think of like a pogo stick. But <gasps> oh you my would, god! But you would hear that you <laughs> like you hear like the, the how the how were you at a pogo stick? I I probably terrible. I think I was on one one time as a kid. I don't even. Remember. I have a vague memory of trying one out. Do they and still being, sell and pogo being sticks? Very unimpressed. Like, that's not a toy. Okay, the reason it, like, is yeah. such a cemented memory in my brain is my childhood neighbor, Nikki, mm-hmm. she got one for holidays one year, birthdays, whatever. And yeah. I was like, what is a pogo stick? I thought it was the coolest thing ever, and I just wanted one so bad. Of course, I never got one, but I was allowed to use hers. Yeah. And boy, was I good at it. Were you? Yeah, but I was also little, so yeah. it's like, I mean, I don't think but that I don't it- remember anybody, like, really catching some crazy air on a pogo stick. I mean, you no. go up in the air, yeah. but, but you're not going, like- bounding over a 10-foot fence kind of air. No, I mean, my parents weren't asking me to wear a helmet to do it, so I yeah. obviously wasn't... I mean, yes, you could get hurt, but not... If mm-hmm. you were going 10 feet in the air and then you come down and you don't land on the stick, like, that's a yeah. problem. I would say I don't think, like, Milton Bradley wants that kind of lawsuit on their hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a few pictures. Okay. Uh, this first one is somebody's dramatic reenactment of the Black Flash. This is from an article in oh, Providence Town good. Magazine. That's good. Mm-hmm. The Black Flash. The legend lives on. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. This next picture is just a cute little pic of a of the beach in downtown Provincetown. Pretty oh, beautiful man. place to terrorize. I do love the East Coast. It's like yes. cod, the cottage style housing and like colonial cute. housing. Yeah. And then finally, someone's photoshopped vision of a shadowy black flash appearing on an old cobblestone street. The shadow. I mean that that would scare the shit out of me. Right. Unless the lights come on and it's yeah, unless the lights come on and it's Ted Lasso, I'm terrified. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, just just in general, running into a shadowy figure in an alley or like a you know a deserted street. Well, and the like the, should be a little scary. Yeah, and the ambiance of a much older place with cobblestone mm-hmm. roads, and then these storefronts that have you can see candles glowing in the window. I mean, this is a particularly spoopy picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like your pink shorts. Thank you. Yeah, very cute. <laughs> Thanks for getting them for me. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, those were fun stories. Yeah, yeah, I liked them just yeah. for changing things up. Yeah. I found them both. Uh, very compelling. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> Good job. I'm going to go on to my stories now if you feel Let's like you want to listen to a, I do. Few, a few tall tales. I, I do. I'm ready. Okay. Take a little Maybe. drink of water and settle in. I know. I was, yesterday, you guys, we were traveling home and uh, I could not drink enough water on the planes yesterday. I don't know what it was. I wasn't hungover. I yeah. mean, I drank quite a bit when we were at camp, but mm-hmm. mostly like white claws. So. Yeah. I don't know if those have a high sodium content, but I was dying. I woke up in the middle of the night, so parched. Were you really thirsty? I was thirsty. It was strange. Uh, yeah, then thirsty this morning. Today, I'm just sad that I don't have a lodge I can go to just to get food all the time. I wish <laughs> I wish I could have been. <laughs> let's just, let's oh just choking right now on water. Speaking of the food at the lodge, yeah. those fucking ribs. I oh, my oh my God. <laughs> Tyler, oh, come on, bro. I'm going to fart. They were really good. <laughs> they were so good. I actually took a video, like a quick little, like, you got to see this. And I sent it to my wife. That's how good Funny. they were. They were, they were yeah. falling off the bones. Mm, yes, crazy. yes, yes. Uh, the When we met the owners, we were asking them, like, kind of, you know, how this came to be and whatever, without like going too far off the the rails here. But the one of the owners had gone to camp there as a kid, and then like you know this developed over many mm-hmm. many years. And one of the people that's part of the partnership of people that run it and own it also went to the camp there as a kid. So it's like this long also going connected thing. to it. Yeah, and it was really sweet. But the the main owners were saying that their kids they'll say to their kids like, okay, what do you guys want for dinner tonight? And they're like, we want to go to the lodge. Yeah, and in they, the winter they'll do this, and they don't. The kids don't understand that like. That's mommy and daddy's business. Yeah. And we have employees that work there that do all the cooking. Like, it's not a restaurant. We can't go there and, like, yeah. order food. I and that, they get devastated by it. I love it. that they were doing that in the winter when, like, th- they weren't running the lodge. Right. It's like, no so, one's there, honey. Yeah, no one's there. It's an yeah. empty building right now. I know. It's really, really cute. And even cuter, the owner's mom. So, like, these these kids' grandma, mm-hmm. she's the, the head baker there. <sighs> and the banana bread was, like, <laughs> holy Hades. So good. All right. Are you ready, Spaghetti? I am. Okay, so we are going to start with a questionable imaginary friend story. Okay. Dear Crystal Queen and her spooky king, let me tell you about my imaginary friend, Tommy. I was born with a birth defect that may have killed me, which is why my mom has always thought I had a strange connection to the spiritual world as a kid. I used to say strange things, as any kid does, but when I was telling my mom, what I was telling my mom, was almost too complex for me to make up when I was about three and again at the age of five. My mom said I used to tell her that I had a family before I came to this family, as if I had some kind of choice between being born into a family as I knew them. Mm -hmm. I always told my mom about growing up in a dark family, a horrible place with a mom and a dad, and instead of a sister, I had a brother, a detail I somehow never forgot to add to my stories. I informed her that I was scared of being with the other family, Now, let's talk about how I met my friend Tommy. My mom and dad both worked for the same grocery store chain, and when I was younger, I would, uh, when I didn't have school for whatever reason, it was easy for them to take turns staying home with me. My dad was a maintenance man for several of the stores, so I often spent time in large, vacant, store-like facilities where shipment trucks were loaded. I used to ride my scooter on the loading docks. (laughs) My parents were talking to each other one time while I was riding my scooter up and down the loading dock. On one side of the dock, there were many shopping carts from the store. My mom told me that one of the carts very suddenly rushed across the room and smacked into the wall behind them. Now, my mom is a firm believer in the paranormal, so when this occurred, she immediately assumed it was a ghost of some kind since the loading dock was empty and I was off riding my scooter and not at all near them. After that little incident, my mom walked into my room to find me talking to myself. She asked, who are you talking to? I looked up at her and said, oh, just my friend Tommy. Where did you meet Tommy? She asked. While I was with dad at work. And she told me, you cannot invite him into our home without asking me first. I told her he was nice and she didn't need to worry. My mom and my dad, uh, my mom to my dad, Sorry, I cannot read this sentence. Uh, My mom spoke to my dad to discuss the strange things I was saying to her. Has Isabel spoken to you about her new imaginary friend, Tommy? She said as she walked into our backyard. 
My dad never talks about ghosts because he doesn't believe in them. However, he replied to my mom, shh, don't talk about him. He's over there. He's watching us. My mom was a bit shocked, but thought he was joking. Ha ha, she said. No, he isn't. But my dad insisted. Shh, yes, he is. So she stopped talking about Tommy and moved on. The longer I talked to Tommy, the more things happened in my house. My mom saged the house a lot, and eventually things stopped, and I no longer talked about my friend Tommy. I grew up and my connection weakened, but I truly do remember what Tommy looked like. He was a small, pale boy with dark brown hair and dark brown eyes that were almost black. Now that I think about it, I suppose it might have been my brother from my past life making sure I was in the right place. Or maybe it was an evil spirit pretending to be him, hoping to wreak havoc on my family. Recently, something happened that brought this all back to me. I'm an online homeschooler, so I was home alone when I heard tapping on my walls. My room faces the backyard with two big windows on the opposite sides of my bed, which is pushed into the corner of my room. When I heard the tapping, I thought someone was outside trying to scare me, maybe even trying to break in. I was completely still, trying not to move. The tapping eventually stopped, and I very carefully peered out the window. Nothing. But then the tapping started again, and now it was on a different wall, and it kept bouncing all around my room. I called my dad for backup. He told me to lock the doors and that he would come home from work early, but to call him back if anything else happened. I went back to my room and the tapping started again. It was coming from every direction. I called for my dogs to come to my room to keep me safe. My black lab, Claude, barks at everything she hears, but it was as if she could hear nothing because she wasn't barking. Of course, the one time I needed her to bark, she didn't. When my mom got home later that day, I told her about the tapping and made her listen to a few recordings I had taken so that she'd believe me. And she asked, Mm -hmm. what time did this happen? Around noon or maybe one, why? Oh, well, because around that same time, I was talking about your friend Tommy to one of my coworkers. Immediate chills. <laughs> Isabel. Weird. Weird, right? Uh, yeah, I like the, I like the um, parent-child connection in this one. Yeah. Like both experiencing things revolving around whatever this thing might have been, mm-hmm. as opposed to a lot of these stories where like the kid is hearing these things, tells the parents, the parents like, no, come on, you're fine. Yeah. And it, 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 in the story also never feels like the um, the mom is like trying to push her into believing this stuff. Oh, right, right. You know, it, I mean, she says her mom, you know, openly believed in the paranormal. So that yeah. like, you know, that influence is going to be there. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, that's a, that's a cool like uh, how the the two witnesses, you know, connect in that one. Yeah, yeah. I, I liked how the dad is mm-hmm. like not into this stuff. Mm-hmm. But when the mom goes to talk to the dad about it. It's just like such a conversation I can see happening. Like, shh, he's over there. And the mom's like, oh, okay, yeah, whatever. Because this right, dad right. never believes it. He's like, no, seriously, shut up. Like that little, he's yeah, seeing yeah, it. Like this. Yeah. And I wonder if that was the dad's only ever encounter with the paranormal since he's not a big believer. Yeah, I guess he'd be a believer after that. Yeah, I think he'd have to be. Mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a and, whole family affair. I know. And it's cool how like it happens early on and then it goes away. And then all these years later, because I'm guessing Isabel is probably like high school aged. If you're uh-huh. able to be a left home alone by choice homeschooler, I'm going to guess that Isabel is in her high school years. Mm-hmm. And it first started. High, yeah. Yeah. All the, you know, it happened all those years before. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's like, well, I was talking about Tommy. So Tommy was knocking on the walls. Like that's very fascinating. Where's Tommy now? Where's Tommy? Can Tommy, you bring him back? Tommy move on. I don't know. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Or maybe, and I also like that Isabel expresses like, you know, it could ju- also just be something else trying to trick me. Right, right. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Isabella. Yes. Thank you. It's Isabel. Isabel. <sighs> my, bra- my brain automatically added the, uh, uh I'm so used to uh, well, cause Isabella. Well, because our, uh, somebody that we know has a daughter named Isabella. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Ready for one more? Yeah. Okay. This story is called, She Called for Me. Okay. Hi, Dan. Hi, Lindsay. I'm writing this on behalf of my mom, who's been listening to you guys since October of last year and listens to you guys any chance she gets. My mom has had so many more experiences she could share, but this is the story that sticks out the most. I had thought my grandpa had made this up until I learned that the house was real. Okay, now let's get down to business. It was the early 1980s. My grandpa Don and his two friends, Gordon and Mike, were going fishing up in Lando Lakes, Wisconsin. They were renting a cabin for a few days. The owner of the campground was a friend of Mike's, and she also happened to be the caretaker of the Summerwind Mansion and invited them to tag along on one of her daily walkthroughs. My grandpa had never really heard of the Summerwind until they got there, where he was told the history by the caretaker. 
At the moment, my grandpa didn't say anything, but when he looked at the top floor, he saw a woman in a white dress standing in one of the windows, staring at them. Mm. When they went inside, they saw blood stains on the floor, and no matter how hard they had tried to get rid of them, nothing had worked. He was told that there had been a murder-suicide in the building in the 1800s, and because there's no records of this, they doubt the validity. As the group explored the mansion, my grandpa felt off, almost like they were being watched. The caretaker suggested that they go see the basement. Mm -hmm. As my grandpa went to walk down the stairs, he stopped dead in his tracks after feeling a cold breeze shoot through him. It was almost as though something was saying, don't go down there. Gordon, puzzled by his sudden hesitance, said, come on, Don, come on down with us. To which my grandpa said no and went outside to wait. While he was waiting, he saw a light go on in one of the rooms and the same woman in the white dress in another room. He went back inside to get the caretaker to ask if they had left a light on upstairs. When he and the caretaker got back outside, the light was off and the woman was gone, to which the caretaker simply responded, this happens all the time. He never mentioned seeing the woman to anyone, not even the caretaker. Once his friends were done exploring the mansion, they all went back to their cabin. They had a really nice dinner and were getting their fishing poles ready for their early fishing trip the next morning. As it was getting dark, they heard someone calling, Don, Don, <laughs> from the enclosed porch where they were sitting. It sounded like it was coming from the direction of the lake. They were all confused, unsure of what they had just heard. They brushed it off until they heard it again a few minutes later. Don, Don. This time it was a bit louder. The group of friends were confused. One of them suggested it could have been the mansion's caretaker calling out for help. Mike suggested they ought to go check on her. She was staying just a few minutes down the road from them, but when they got there, she wasn't home. They decided to go back to their cabin. I mean, what else could they do? As they were sitting there on the front porch, figuring out who would be calling my grandpa's name in the first place, they heard it again. They decided to get in their boat and follow the sound of the voice. Mm. Concerned the caretaker was in distress, maybe even drowning in the lake. They did a solid search around the lake, but there was no one there. The voice never called out again. They brushed it off, went back to the cabin, and turned in for the night, all of them uneasy about their experience. The next morning, before going on their fishing trip, they thought it was best to go back to the caretaker's house to check on her, just in case. They explained what had happened, and she asked, She was calling for you, wasn't she, Don? Mm -hmm. Yes. The caretaker said, It's because you saw her. You saw her, didn't you? My grandpa gave her a confused look, to which the caretaker repeated, You saw her at the mansion, didn't you? He confessed, yes, I saw her in the window. My grandpa never went back to that cabin or that mansion, and I don't blame him. My mom and I discovered that the Summerwind Mansion is no longer standing. It burned down just a few years after my grandpa walked its halls. Thanks for reading my mom's story. I wrote it, but she hit the send <laughs> button. Uh, Alyssa funny. and Venice. Alyssa or Melissa? Alyssa. Alyssa and? Venice. Venice. Ah, cool names. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, and, and good story too. I, for for a second there, I was like, man, it's Summerwind Mansion. I'm like, that sounds so familiar. I think it's because we just recently had a hotel that was like the Sundown or Sundown yeah, the, or something or this the, the Sunway Sunway. Sunway. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah, Sunway and Summerwind. Very Next, similar. Yeah, because I was like, hmm, do I know this? And then at the end, when you're like, oh, burned down, I was like, nah, I nope. must, must not be thinking of that. No, but but maybe like maybe it's a source for some other cool stories. Like, who's the woman in the white dress? Who was murder suicide? Mm-hmm. If those legends are out there from mm -hmm. I don't know how long ago her grandpa was there. You know, uh, sometimes sometimes when those things like burn down too early, not a too early, but like a, a while back. <laughs> too early. Um, I, hate, I hate it when things burn down <laughs> before I'm ready for them to burn down. The stories too early. Don't, they don't make it to the web. Yeah. You know, like they die with the witnesses. Yeah. Yeah, mm. but but I mean, then there's you know, legends and stories told on, you know, by families just like this. Yeah, totally, so it's like there totally. might be somebody who's something out there shared something about this. And you said that was the last. Didn't you say there was gonna be three? Yeah, I do have. I have another story. Oh, okay. I I thought you said right before you told that one, that, like uh, that you have like this is my last story, or I thought you alluded to it being the last one. I was like, wait a minute, mm. but I didn't want to interrupt, interrupt you. Okay, I good. I don't think I should. Okay, okay, good, 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 good. I think you made that up. I thought there was three. There's three. But yeah, I like that one. Yeah, be, me too. That'd be so creepy to be at a cabin and then hear somebody calling your name and then not be able to find the source of it. It, it was making me think of when the band was playing, not to keep talking about camp, but it's a very <laughs> similar thing where, you know, like he's, they're by the lake and it sounds like oh, the mansion yeah. was right on the, or next to the water. Yeah. And it's weird how a lake 
with a little bit of like hills around it, like a bowl, that kind of bowl setting. Yeah. We'll play with sound. Or like carry it. Yeah. It was weird because like the when we were like, I don't know, a couple hundred yards down this little trail down the lake to go to our cabins and the band was playing back by the lodge. Mm-hmm. It felt like the sound like did this big U, like it went out uh, ahead of like the lodge mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then like bent around the lake and like came back and hit us from the other side. It was really weird. Now I'm just thinking about how fun it's going to be to share scared to death stories at camp. Yeah, the sound's going to you know, play with people. Mm-hmm. And we have this like really cool outdoor setting for it mm-hmm, and it's going to mm-hmm. be... It's going to be nice and spooky. So spooky. Oh, so yeah. excited. Okay, uno mas? Yes. Okay, yes. This story, I love this. I think it's going to give you a, a good spook and also a good chuckle. Okay, good. Hello, Dan and Lindsay. Hello. Hello. I'm a licensed funeral director in southwestern (laughs) Ontario. I worked in a small town funeral home that originally opened in 1920. Wow. The building was an old Victorian style home from 1887. One day during my internship for college, I was labeling urns in the basement where the selection or casket room was. Mm -hmm. The urn I was labeling had a reflective finish like a mirror. In the reflection behind me, I could see the double doors were moving rapidly. Too much for it to be a breeze from an open window. I turned around and the door stopped abruptly. I could see in the crack of the doors that someone was standing behind them, a tall, slim shadow of a person. I assumed it was my smart ass of a co-worker and me being a sassy 19-year-old girl yelled out, good try, but you didn't scare me, asshole. (laughs) I turned around and continued my labeling. The minute I turned around, the door started moving again. Annoyed now, I thought to myself, ugh, enough is enough. I got up and walked over to the doors once again, only for them to stop moving. I swung the doors open quickly, aiming to catch my tormentor, but no one was standing there. But I did hear the sound of someone walking away. Of course, I followed behind them quickly, thinking if I moved fast enough, I would catch my coworker. So there I am, walking through the darkness, chasing after my coworker until I saw his shadow walk up the stairs. I heard the door close at the st- I heard the door close to the upstairs level. I thought it was such a stupid prank. I walked back to the urns and carried on with my labeling. Eventually, I finished my job and made my way back upstairs. Once I got back to the main office of the lobby, I saw the receptionist. I told her what my other coworker was up to, trying to terrify me. Her facial expression went from confused to concerned. After I finished my story, she hesitated before telling me that my coworker had left two hours ago and that she and I had been been the only ones in the building since then. And she, being an 80-year-old woman, would not have been down in the basement given that she couldn't go up and down the stairs very well. Mm. I continued to work there for four more years and definitely was more aware of the faint noises I heard and the shadowy movements that I would see out of the corner of my eye. But most times, I would just say, fuck this, (laughs) and keep doing whatever it was I was doing. Regards, Hildy. Hildy, thank you. Yeah, I guess you're not going to be... If you're going to work in like an old Victorian building converted into a funeral home and- and, and As a funeral director or like at that time, whatever, I don't know the, like the steps, but yeah, an embalmer or whatever. Yeah, like you're working with dead bodies, like down in the basement. Um, You're not someone who's easily spooked. You can't be. No. I don't think that you can work with dead bodies and be someone that's easily spooked because there's things uh, that that bodies do yeah. even after they're deceased. You know, they, they, let, they let out that breath. Sometimes smells come out. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, it's not like they suddenly start talking or anything, but like they do make sounds. I kept thinking during the story uh, of when we were, you know, back when we did TLA, that one movie, The Autopsy of Jane Doe. Oh, yeah, that's good. Mm-hmm. Just that whole setting. I'm surprised like more horror movies aren't done in like a mortuary setting. Maybe it's too expected. Yeah, yeah, but I, I liked I liked a lot of elements of that movie. You know, just made me think of this one too. When they're like, you know, you're down. I mean, there was two of them. It was like a yeah. father and son for the most of it. But like, you're down there. It's quiet. You're like cutting into like the sounds of like cutting into the body and preparing it and things. And it's an old building. There's going to be creaks and stuff. Why aren't there more stories told about coroners as well? Because they also spent like uh, horror movies, or mm. you know, or like people. I, I would love a good fan tale of like is somebody out there a corner because I mean you're with dead bodies all the time mm-hmm. and you have to do I, I mean if you're doing an autopsy you have a far more invasive job I think than an embalmer I don't know I don't know enough about the difference between the two I mean well, if you're I think embalming that, you're cutting into them too right yes but I think that an autopsy like you're really getting in details you're like weighing, yeah, weighing you're, organs and things and yeah, testing all kinds of stuff and i think it depends on the the death so it's like yeah. if you were shot and killed 
mm-hmm. that's pretty straightforward autopsy. Like you, you, they might be retrieving bullets because now we have a crime scene, right? But if you die of a suspicious, you you die a suspicious death. Yeah, it's like you you were healthy and well, and then all of a sudden something happened, and people are suspicious that your partner may have poisoned you. Well, now it's like a different kind of autopsy as opposed to just an old person who mm-hmm. passes away from life or disease or whatever. It's like, yeah. do you need an autopsy on that person? Probably not. Right. God, I'm fascinated with that uh, whole field. Aut- J- yeah, uh, just as someone who's never even like been around a dead body, you know, like that we talked about that before. Uh, oh yeah, because your grandfather's casket was it closed? Hmm. Yep, it was. Yeah, it sure was. It's so weird because my family does open caskets. Yeah, yeah. Just even like, in like situations where maybe that wasn't a good idea. Yeah, where I grew up, it's all like closed. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just to think about being like, yeah, just like touching them, and I mean, I guess you know, you just get used to anything. Yeah. But like, just such a weird like duality of when you do that kind of work, like Hildy's doing that, like you're around the living all the time, so you're on warm living bodies. Yeah. And then also part of your job is around cold dead bodies, and just a different level of comfort around. Just bodies. Yeah, it is weird. Like if you go to an open casket funeral, um, mm. because you're so used to seeing bodies in motion right. and they're just like stiff in there and there's like all this makeup on them because of the color and all yeah. the things and whatever. Uh, you're, my feeling is that I'm always kind of waiting for the body to move. I know it's not going to. I know mm. they're deceased, but it's like I kind of just keep, you're yeah, like. Your brain is used to seeing bodies move. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it's so strange. When my mom's sister, one of my aunts passed away, she had wanted to be cremated. Mm -hmm. And my mom said it was like the saddest, saddest funeral that they ever had. It was was so like, my mom was like, please don't even fly home for this. I don't want you to see this because she knew what it was going to entail. So when you're cremated, you can, this is so crazy. You can rent a coffin so that you can still have a, a viewing so you mm. could still have the body before they're cremated or just like the representation of it. But my aunt didn't want to do that. She was like, ah, oh, who cares? And this is the kind of shit my dad says to me. Ah, just throw me in a pine box. My mom said it was the saddest thing because instead of having a coffin, she was literally in a cardboard box with like uh, like a plastic lining in it and it's like zip tied. Like it, they're, because they're going to then take mm-hmm. that, fold it closed and, and put it in it. the incinerator. My mom said it was the saddest, saddest thing. Like obviously, huh. you know, she's deceased and all of that, but like as humans, we want to see other human bodies in a like comfortable, po- yeah, comfortable yeah, yeah. position. Like she said it was the most un, like awful thing. Weird. Weird. Yeah. yeah. I know. I keep getting distracted. Um, I noticed this the other day when I was working in here, we repositioned the camera just slightly. And when I look at like this camera, that's more like for me, Yeah, I can see it's perfectly framed. One of the little dolls on the desk is staring right into it. So it's like the doll is staring right back at me. Hmm? This one? No. No, she has a little hood on, little baby here in the front. Uh, Um, I think you're imagining things. No. I know, I'm just kidding. This one, it's this one. She's wearing a bonnet. No. This chick. I Maybe can't. it's on your specific. Hold on, let me try. Let me I, try I can't figure out how that to one. like where. Oh yeah, the little. It is a little baby. Um. Uh. The the body. It is that one. It is that one. Yep. Yeah, there's you your hand. On okay. The screen. There. Yeah. Go. Yeah. Yeah. Weird. <laughs> Sorry. But to see like her reflection in the lens. It's like I was watching getting, me. I was getting really nervous. So I was like, oh boy, they're gonna play a prank on me. Something's about to drop out of the ceiling. A baby doll's gonna fly across <laughs> the room. Like I was getting very. My heart started uh, to race a little bit. Like. <laughs> Please don't do it. Oh, well, thanks for those stories. Yeah, they're fun ones. Mm-hmm. Do you want to go first or do you want me to I'll go, go first? I'll go first. Okay, we'll have at it, Dan. I would like to thank the following Annabelles for supporting us on Patreon, which helps us so much. Thanks to Stephen Gelot or Gelote? Probably Gelot. Uh, Daniel Seymour. Uh, Madeline Barron. Danielle, probably Seymour is how to pronounce that better. Uh, Jeremy Samara. Charles McArthur. Laura Mendez Gray. Tyler Wilson, so funny, like know, one Tyler. letter off of my childhood best friend. Uh, Vixen Violencia, uh, Lau Gal Lily, and Reed Palmer. Nice. I would like to thank the following Annabelles for their support on Patreon as well. I'm more thankful than Dana is just so oh, you guys okay. know. Yeah. Uh, Bone Daddy and Bone Mommy, <laughs> Clarissa, uh, Lisa Rebel, Brady Brecher, Grape Hayes. Rye bread. All right, that's it. Rye bread and grape haze have to be a couple. (laughs) That's it. You guys have to get together. Uh, Because then we'd have, let's see, who's, I don't know who's going to take whose last name, but we might have grape bread or we might have a rye haze. Mm -hmm. It's going to be super fun. Jake Hallett, Gabriella Smith, Dustin Morris, and Roberto Martinez. Perfect. And then I have some spooky shout outs. To Aspen from K. Happy birthday. 
to Bubby from Melly. Happy birthday. I love you so much. And I can't wait till we're married. And then also another shout out from Melly to Guinea Pig from Melly. Have an amazing day. I love you. So I think it's like one is the fiance and one is the sister, I want to say. This is cute. To Nincompoop Ed Boy from Cameron, your freshly squeezed soul. Happy birthday. Funny. (laughs) To Matthew from Tater Tot. Happy birthday. I hope you have a great day. And to Felix from Delia. Happy birthday. Oh, that's very nice. Very, very nice. And that is our show. Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Looking for a story from a coroner. Oh, yeah. We, uh, you can email us for everything else at info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks to Logan Keith, Tyler C. for the work on social media with Ryan Handelsman and his team. And to Logan again, running badmagicmerch.com and producing and directing today. Woohoo! Uh, Zach Cohen for custom soundbed creation. Thanks to Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. Thanks to our book editor, Drew Atana polishing and preparing listener stories for book number four coming soon. Thanks to Olivia Lee for finding both the stories I shared this week. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you'd like to watch the show. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Scared to Death Podcast for pictures that accompany episodes and more. And our TikTok at Scared to Death Podcast. Uh, We have, you know, little highlights from the show and different things. We have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, where you can meet fellow horror lovers and if you don't want to hear any ads, you want monthly bonus episodes and more, find us on Patreon and go to badmagicmerch.com for those camp tickets. Do it. Do it. Enjoy your nightmares, creeps and peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scare to death. Bad Magic Productions. Uh-uh. 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 Uh-uh.